us he knew better than you would Yes, know. yes, you, you know, know every question. That's right. You just have to guide, he'll guide me through the program. I'll do my best. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we good. Uh, to the latest seminar from the Henry George School of Social Science. My name is Alan Collison. I'm a Henry George School board member. And I introduced the topic this way. It was probably the most controversial company mm -hmm. in, in certainly the United States and maybe the world, because Walmart was going to eat the American economy. It was so enormous, it had such economies of scale, such reach, such lobbying power, there was no stopping it. Well, anyone who's been reading the news lately understands that those days are pretty much over, and that Walmart has been succeeded, for better or worse, by a generation of technology giants, um, one of which is the subject of today's talk, because not only does its rise present or raise major questions about monopoly, about privacy, all the tech-related issues that have made so much news lately, but its latest venture in disruption promises to raise maybe more profound questions about our society and our very culture. And no one is more qualified, at least that I know, to talk about Amazon's project to disrupt the American book publishing business, and no doubt the global book publishing business, than our guest, Robin Gaster, who is completing a book on this tech giant's rise, its present, and what its future might mean for all of us. Dr. Gaster is currently president of the DC-based consulting firm uh, called Incumetrics, which focuses on the economics of innovation and growth. He has consulted for several U.S. government agencies, including the Census Bureau and the National Institutes of Standard and Technology, as well as private advocacy groups and business groups, nonprofits like the like Education Education Development Associates and the Electronic Power Research Institute, along with private businesses like Siemens and also Deloitte. He is currently a research associate at George Washington University. Uh, he is a non-resident fellow at the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation, a Washington DC think tank studying all the subjects. And he holds a BA from England's Oxford University, a master's from Kent University, and a PhD from America's own University of California, Berkeley. Um, Robin will talk for about 25 or 30 minutes. Um, we'll then take questions from the audience, but I'd also like to point out to our online viewers that you can submit questions also uh, in the comment box of our YouTube channel, and somehow they will magically get to my cell phone, and I'll be and I'll be happy to ask them for you. So, so I'd like to uh, now present Robin, and uh, we're really looking forward to your presentation. Thank you, Alan. So Amazon, I believe that Amazon is the most important of the big companies, the big tech companies, by far the most important. Facebook owns all our personal data, it's true, and has many more uh, uh, members. Google is the heart of the knowledge economy. Apple has all the prettiest toys. But Amazon, Amazon is everywhere. And, and Amazon is only getting started. So what I'm going to talk about today is where Amazon is now, where it's going, and what we need to be thinking about. Um, it's hard to believe that Amazon started 25 years ago in Jeff Bezos' garage. That's not a long time ago. I was 14 when Amazon started. Uh, it, today, Amazon is a $230 billion company. More to the point, it's, it's, so it's huge, it's enormous. It has five multi-billion dollar businesses. And it grew its revenue last year by 30%. That's a staggering thing for some entity that's that big to grow that fast and to show
show no signs of slowing down. What I'm going to talk about today is how that happens and why the book business is such, an, such a good way to think about what Amazon does. Books were first for, for Amazon. They started as a, you know, just an online bookseller. I, I think it's worth noting that they pick books not because they care about books at all. They pick books because they're standardized, they're light, they're easy to ship, and there were only two distributors that they needed to buy books from. So it was an easy decision to decide to go for book. But they don't care about the inside of the book at all. Mm -hmm. So this is where Amazon is in the books uh, sales, book in, in, in books. This is, I would say that there are lots of data problems in books. Uh, so all of these are estimates from different places. Uh, there are three things worth noting about this immediately. Um, print is still by far the biggest. Ebooks are catching up. Ebooks were at zero 10 years ago. There were 12 years ago. There, there were no ebooks sold. Audio is catching up too. It, um, and we'll talk about how that works in a moment. I think it's worth noting this too. This is the share of each of those sectors that Amazon sells. It, 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 it's, <laughs> it's impressive. The share of print is growing by between 2 and 4% annually. So if you take the long view that Amazon does, Amazon's share of the book, of even the print business that it doesn't publish, will continue to grow steadily. Amazon owns most of ebooks, most of self published books, and most of so the question is, okay, they came from nowhere. How, how did they actually do that? I think the best way to understand it is how did Amazon um, capture its customers? How many of you have Amazon Prime? Yeah, there's a few heads nodding there. So Amazon Prime is Amazon's glue that sticks you to them. Amazon Prime gives you benefits, it gives you free shipping, it gives you Amazon Video, it gives you Amazon Music, it gives you, it gives you, it gives you. It fulfills your whims before you even know what they really are. Um, there are 125 million households in America, according to the Census Bureau. Amazon Prime has 105 million members. So four-fifths of households in America are connected to Amazon Prime, plus or minus. That's astounding. I don't, I don't think even that number uh, pay their taxes. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. And these are voluntary taxes paid by anybody who um, wants to join, and they pay tax. They pay $119 a year to be an Amazon Prime member. That's a flat rate. $12 billion for Amazon. All right, so how does Amazon do this? How, how does Amazon make itself so unbelievably attractive? I think there are, there are four core features to try and understand. Amazon, Amazon is unbelievably convenient. Um, we'll, we'll talk in more detail about it, but from a customer perspective, Amazon is unbelievably convenient. While I was sitting there, I bought a couple of books. <laughs> not, only, not only did I buy the books, they delivered the books. <laughs> they showed up on my screen right there as I was sitting there. It's hard to beat that for convenience, isn't it? Um, yesterday, Amazon, uh, two days ago, Amazon announced a new program. You may have uh, become aware that for Prime members, they will ship your goods in one day. Next day shipping. Fine. Wonderful. They decided to, yesterday that they will um, Apply that to every item available on Amazon that costs at least one dollar. That means if you need a toothbrush, one toothbrush, they will ship it to you free. And it will arrive the next day. It is difficult to imagine anything more convenient, but they are working on it. They are imagining that they can push this down to four hours. Selection. Well, Amazon has become the everything store. That was the title of a well-known book. They are the everything store. 
a Walmart, a giant Walmart, carries 120,000 different items. That's their biggest Walmart. Amazon offers 350 million items. You can buy anything. It is extraordinary. The selection is completely unmatched. When we talk about um, the book, about books and bookstores, we'll see how that changes the economics of the industry. Prices. Amazon has made a fetish of cutting prices. They're not always the lowest. Sometimes Walmart undercuts them, other times uh, other, other people manage to, to do this. Basically, you know when you go to Amazon that you may not be getting the best price, but you are getting a good price. And more to the point, on the very screen, as you'll see, Amazon puts its competitors' prices. They're hiding nothing. And we've talked a bit about Amazon Prime. I, I do see that as the glue. Let's talk for a minute about convenience. It, it, is, it is hard to beat this. Free shipping, free returns. Amazon will tell you what you bought before and what you might like as a result. You can, nowadays, you can have a subscription service. So your toilet paper will show up every Friday on your doorstep. You no longer even have to order. Now, of course, if you do have to order, now you can just shout at Alexa, and Alexa will do the ordering for you. So Amazon, what Amazon is in the business of doing is reducing the friction of buying something to zero. Pretty close. Pretty close. It, it's hard to see how you get to be more convenient. That's what they want, zero friction shopping. Shopping where your whim goes straight to their warehouse with no intervening variable whatsoever. I want to talk a bit about the everything store because Amazon made a huge strategic decision about 2001. Look, a traditional uh, um, department store buys stuff, puts it out, and sells it. That's the model, right? That's how, and that's how it's always been done. You buy, you sell, that kind of business. Amazon decided that in order to become the everything store, it couldn't have everything. It couldn't afford to buy everything. You know, I mean, you can buy a car on Amazon. They, uh, they can't put cars in their warehouse. That doesn't make any sense. So instead, they opened the doors of their web page to everyone. They turn themselves from a retailer into a bazaar. So there are now hundreds of thousands of other vendors selling on Amazon. Amazon has become a platform instead of a retailer. So this is a this is an extraordinary risk. I mean, at the time, Sears was a big deal. You wouldn't imagine Sears calling up Macy's and saying, hey, do you want to sell in our store? No problem. Come right on over. And not only that, we'll give you a good position. And if you happen to be, have the cheapest prices, your product will be right there in the buy box, ready to go. Come on in. A remarkable thing to do. There are now more than a million other vendors on the Amazon website. Big brands like Nike that fought against being on Amazon for years have given up. They decided they have to be there because that's where the customers are. We're going to come to logistics in a minute, but those vendors use Amazon's logistics network. And what that does is it makes that network more efficient and cheaper because it has more volume going through it. So by having all these extra, extra vendors, Amazon's whole system becomes more efficient. It completely drives Amazon's growth in retail, though not necessarily in books. Right now, as of last year, 58% of, of revenues on Amazon.com didn't come from Amazon products. They came from other people's products. And you can see what the chart looks like, right? I mean, it's, <laughs> it's a pretty steady process. I, I think it's entirely possible that Amazon will get out of the retail business altogether at some point. This is more profitable, it's less risky, you don't have to hold any inventory, it doesn't cost you anything, and the, and the margin is better. So, 
So this is the everything store. This is why Amazon has become the everything store, because they've made a conscious and risky decision, and a revolutionary decision. They do that frequently. I thought it would be fun and interesting to deconstruct a couple of pages. So we, I'm sure that you have all been on Amazon. This is what a search looks like if you search for Thomas Piketty's book. Well, what you get is, first of all, you get all of your own stuff up there. You can find your own, your old orders. You can find the lists that you keep of things you want. You can talk to Amazon through there. Wonderful. You get a note saying, oh, by the way, this is a bestseller. That encourages you to buy it. On the left side, you get all the filters you could imagine. So you can search efficiently, find exactly the right thing you want. You can search by whether it's prime, you can search by whether it falls into a category, whether it's new or used, lots and lots of different opportunities. Most important, perhaps the most important, you can find out what other people think. When we come to the end of this talk, you'll see why that is so important and why Amazon, Amazon's scale makes this so dominant. Look, you can see there, there are 1,800 reviews. It's possible that there are a few crappy reviews in there. In fact, it's certain that there are a few crappy reviews, there are bad reviews, there are badly written reviews, but overall, the wisdom of crowds is right here in front of us. We can look at the wisdom of crowds and the crowds say, well, oh, four and a half stars, that's pretty good. And you can dig in and find out a bit more. It's a very powerful, alternative to previous models where you would look for a review from a well-known reviewer. Forget that. Go online. Find out what everyone who read it thinks, and on average, you can get a pretty good read. It's worth pointing out, what is the first um, option for buying it? It's a Kindle. Why is it a Kindle? Because Amazon owns Kindle. Owns Kindle. It's cheaper for them, and they make more money on it. And they get to present that as the first buying option. Worth noting that you can get it in a day if you want a paperback. Worth noting that Amazon is quite happy to put up there 86 other offers that are all cheaper than what it's suggesting. <laughs> they don't care. They don't care. They're happy if you buy from them. They're happy if you buy from somebody else. They make money either way. Dig in a little more. This is, this is what the actual book page looks like once you decide, oh, I'm going to explore it a bit. First thing, you can look inside the book. Amazon had to fight the publishers tooth and nail to get this function, to allow them to have you as the customer read into the book as before you bought it. The publishers thought this would be terrible, but Amazon prevailed, and you can look inside the book, and it's a very successful feature for them means you can explore multiple books quickly. Um, it's a bit hard to see this. It just says they offer every, every kind of format imaginable, 18 different formats. Buy them all right here. Over here on the right side is the buy box. This was a patented item from, from Amazon. They invented the idea of one-click buying. Remember reducing friction? This reduces friction big time. Instead of doing what you did before, you have to type in your name, your address, your credit card, all that stuff, all gone. One click, and you have bought the book. You can buy it as a gift. Happy to have you send it as a gift, or to keep a list of, uh, of things that you want to, a wish list of gifts. You can follow the author. There's a ton of information in here. We, we don't think about it when we're whizzing around the Amazon website, but there is so much information telling you this, you can do this, you can find out more about that. And, and this applies to everything. It doesn't just apply to books. If you, if you want to find a left-handed pipe wrench, you can find one, and you can find reviews for it, and you can find specs for it that tell you exactly how much grip strength you need. It, it is uh, remarkable. It's worth looking at one or two final things. That's just more formats and more specifics about exactly how much it's going to cost you to go outside Amazon or stay inside. People stay inside. We mentioned that the Kindle was their preferred method. The Kindle is linked to one 
If you just say one click, okay, I'm going to buy it, the default value is the Kindle. That's called the buy box on Amazon, and it's critical. Being in the buy box means you are the default option. And there are consultancies, there are algorithms, there are endless efforts to try and put your product in the buy box. It really matters. It's like being in the front window of Macy's. Actually, more so, probably. All right. So we talked we talk about selection there and how Amazon helps you select, reduces the friction. Let's talk about pricing. Oh, sorry. Let me that one. It's probably from Amazon. Yeah. <laughs> probably is. Um, I can't believe I'm on that. Your toothbrush has arrived. My toothbrush has arrived, that's right. Amazon. Well, Amazon is prepared to go inside your house to deliver now. So, okay. yeah. um, so about 2001, they made a, a, a strategic decision to do everyday low prices. That is to say, they stole Walmart and Costco's model. And they said, all right, we, we're just going to be low price enterprise. We're not going to make money, but we're, we're going we're to be low price. As soon as they got to the point of having serious volume, they started squeezing their vendors, particularly UPS. Uh, they, they went to UPS and asked for discounts in 2004 off, their, off the standard rates, and UPS looked at them and said, no, where are you going to go? Amazon turned off UPS for a week. That was enough. <laughs> UPS caved. And that, that was really the last time anybody tried to bully Amazon. Failed, and that was in 2004. You know, Amazon is a lot bigger now. Amazon has had pretty good success beating up the publishers. They have pushed publishers in multiple ways to increase the discounts that Amazon offers, it is given. So Amazon, when as you saw on the previous page, offers discounts for everything. Every every item is discounted. The publishers pay for most of that discount. So instead of, um, well, it's obvious, and we've talked about marketplace a little bit. For a long time, Amazon had a rule that if you sold on the marketplace, you could not sell for less anywhere else, including your own website. Um, they claim that that rule is no longer in operation, but I don't actually believe it. I, I think if you want to stay on the marketplace, you have to make sure you're giving Amazon the best price. The net result of this is pretty clear. Customers win. Amazon squeezes down the price of things. You win as a customer. You get fewer, you have to pay less. Amazon wins because lower prices do two things. They give them more customers, and they make it less attractive for competitors. When we come to Kindle, we'll see how this really works. But if prices are low and, and margins are low, you get few competitors. And that's a deliberate strategy from Amazon. This part is part of my favorite story. Um, you, you may be aware that Amazon made almost no money for the first 10 years, the first 12 years. They made, they made nothing, they made no profits. Wall Street was constantly berating them. Amazon didn't care, because Amazon was doing something else with the money. This is what happens. Amazon gets an order from one of those many millions of people who like to order things through Amazon, fine. Used to be, Amazon would then order it from, order a book, let's talk about books, from Ingram or Baker and Taylor, the two big distributors. The book would come back to Amazon, someone at Amazon would package it up, walk it down to the post office, and the post office would deliver it. That was the model, pretty simple model. Well, things have changed. Amazon now has 159 warehouses across America. It has 50 odd receiving uh, uh, operations in addition to that, and innumerable drop off places and pick up places. All right? But the warehouses are key. They, they spent a lot of money on those warehouses. All those missing profits, they were invested in physical plants across the country. So now, they that order for Piketty's book doesn't, doesn't go to Ingram anymore. What happened is that Amazon has already pre-populated its 
its warehouses with pickettes. Oh. <laughs> right? They know how many they're going to sell. They're pretty accurate. They've been doing this for a while. They have very good data. They know how many, more or less, they're going to sell of every product in every part of America. So they don't have to wait for your order. No, they, that order has already been shipped. It's already gone to that warehouse near New York. Right? So the order arrives, the books are already there, and instead of waiting for the post office, no, 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 we're not going to do that anymore. Instead of that, we can get rid of the post office, we're going to get rid of UPS, we're going to have our own last mile delivery. All those Amazon vans you see driving around, that's what they're doing. But Amazon is going even further. Amazon is building its own Uber, which is Flex. That is, it's a gig-on-demand driving platform. You sign up, you drive for Amazon, you deliver their packages. Amazon is big. Amazon recently put in an order for a few more vans. Electric vans, by the way. 100,000 of them. One order. But that, even that's not really here. Because Amazon also has something called um, distribution partners. It encourages people to set up job, set up, set up shop as a distributor for Amazon. So it will help you to start a business. It will help you buy trucks. It will help you with software. It will help you understand the business. And it will give you as much work as you can have. In exchange, you hire contractors to do the drive. So you don't, Amazon no longer touches the driving at all. They've created a contractor layer that, that is completely insulated from Amazon. They're never, those people are not working for Amazon, and then and Amazon is not responsible for that. We'll come back to that in a bit. But what you can see here is the net result. Costs are radically reduced because Amazon has made the network incredibly efficient. And delivery speed is up. How do you think Amazon can do next day delivery? They couldn't do it for the post office. It would be prohibitively expensive. So they own the logistics network. That means that Amazon has a huge competitive advantage over anybody else who wants to ship physical goods. And that could be medications, could be apparel, could be <coughs> furniture, doesn't matter. Amazon can deliver it back. Let's talk about something slightly different, which is how Amazon builds entirely new markets. Starting with audiobooks. Audiobooks, they did something that they've tried doing in other places, and it worked. They bought the sector. Basically, they bought Brilliance and Custom Flips and then Audible, which, was, which were the main players in the audiobook sector when they bought them around 2009, 10, 11. <clears throat> They grew it. When they bought that Audible, Audible had 80,000 items available. Now they have about half a million items and they sold a billion hours of audio uh, entertainment last year. They also use cross-segment leverage. This is an important thing. So audiobooks were cool, Kindle was cool, but when you put them together, you get something new. Now you can have your Kindle tell you, read you your book, if you feel like it. So um, this gave audiobooks a whole new outlet, and it made Kindle more valuable. So it worked both ways. Of course, we haven't yet gotten to story time for Alexa. But that's clearly coming, right? I mean, Alexa will read you stories. It will read you your Audible books. It will read you anything. And it will pretty soon read, be reading you well anything in text, too. So Alexa is an entirely new channel into your attention universe. Kindle is fascinating for other reasons, too. Kindle was, Kindle was a non-starter when it started in 2007. There was no demand for it. Previous efforts had failed. There was no content, there was no technology. For Amazon, that wasn't really a problem. They spent the money. They built the Kindle, the one on the left, the white one, is the original Kindle. 
It was 20 ounces, it was clunky, it held 200 books, right? The one on the right is the modern version. It holds thousands of books. It's backlit, it's waterproof, it weighs a couple ounces. It weighs less than a paperback book. It's more convenient than a paperback book. It allows me to adjust the size of the font so that it is perfect for me. And it's taken a third of the market. Um, it's worth understanding what happened here. Amazon had a vision. Well, actually, Jeff Bezos had a vision. It was his personal passion project, and he made it happen. Um, they did the technology, which they had some luck that the technology matured at about the time they needed it. But more important, they strung on the publishers into this new world of Kindle books. Um, they they believed that they needed 100,000 books in digital format for the thing to work when they launched. And after a year of pressure, they got 90,000. The publishers thought that they were onto a good thing. They thought that they would make more money because they would sell for the same price that they wouldn't have to print the book. Brilliant. Dead easy. Unfortunately, um, Amazon changed that. Uh, from the stage of the Kindle launch, Amazon announced that they would be selling all their books for $9.99. And at a loss. Every book would be sold at a loss because publishers wouldn't sell to Amazon at that price. This is one of the advantages of our on-site New York City location. Right. This is real life happening before your eyes. <laughs> that won't help much. It won't help much. <laughs> All right. So that one, a little bit. All right. Well, we'll just, we'll, we'll just, we'll speak up. We'll, we'll, we'll just continue. Okay. So Amazon insisted, not, not that, Amazon insisted that the benefits of Kindle go to the customer not to the publishers. The publishers were, were left to understand how they had committed a serious offense against their own business model. Uh, they, they had decided that they were going to sell to Amazon for a discount, but they, it put their entire hardcover driven business model at risk. They used to make their money selling $25 hardcovers, and that now became essentially unfeasible when you could buy the same book for 10 bucks and have it delivered to you instantly. So Kindle upset the, the, the existing business model of the, of the publishers in a serious way. I'm not going to go into all the details of how they responded. The reality is that there, a third of books now are in Kindle. That's enough to restrain the publisher's model. This is an interesting quote I got from Barry Heisler, and I, I'm going to read it to you then, uh, quickly. The key point is that a self-published author working alone has exactly the same distribution reach in digital as a multi-million dollar New York publishing conglomerate. That's absolutely radical and transformative. It used to be that the publishers owned the game, mm -hmm. and it now appears not so much. We'll come back and we can talk about whether Eisler is really right about that. Let's talk about this business model thing for a minute. So, because we're going to come to the last of the great Amazon innovations in this sector, uh, and it's a pretty good one. So, this is the traditional business model. There are a bunch of filters that happen before publication. So, I'm an author, you're an author, we are scrambling around trying to find an agent. We are auditioning for agents. The agents Look at us and say, ah, rubbish, don't want you. But for a few of us, a select few, <clears throat> the agent says, okay, I'll take you on. Now you've got to find a publisher. Not all books accepted by agents get published. Some do, some don't, fine. Eventually, I'm lucky, I get published, and now I have to find reviews under the old system. I have to find somebody at the Washington Post or the New York Times or the New York Review of Books, a few places that are prepared to actually review my book. Once they've been reviewed, I think I have a decent chance of getting it into a bookstore. Bookstores have very limited shelf space. 
They need to sell a lot of books. They need to keep things moving. They don't take too many chances on books. So all those prior filters are in fact necessitated by the existence of a physical bookstore. Somebody has to help the bookstores decide which of all those millions of potential authors they should have on their shelves. And that whole system is designed to do just that. So you have these limited number of books, and then I walk in as a customer and I can buy that book. If it's not there, I can order it from somewhere else, and it takes a couple of weeks, etc., etc. But by and large, I'm buying from the bookstore. And it's been a funnel all the way down. No longer. Amazon is completely different. Amazon's pu new self-publishing model is really different. So you start with all your thousands and thousands of potential authors. Any one of them can go onto the Amazon website and publish it using the Kindle Direct Publishing KDP. Amazon will publish everything. They don't care. No filter. They publish in print. They publish it in Kindle. It goes out in two or three weeks. You send them your formatted document and your cover out the door. And not only that, it goes out worldwide. It goes out through the Amazon online store. So that bookstore with its limited capacity has been transformed into Amazon's website with overwhelming unlimited capacity. Everything gets published. We've had no filters yet. All the filters happen after publication, not before publication. So the most important filter perhaps is customer reviews. We talked about those before. Amazon owns all the customer reviews. Now I went, I, just as a check, I went to look at, uh, um, at a bicycle that was for sale on Walmart and on Amazon, all right? Amazon had 1,700 reviews. Not bad. Walmart had 37. Mm -hmm. Not enough information. Not enough information to, to make a decision. Amazon owns the reviews because it's the biggest service. So we have customer reviews. We have Amazon's automated recommendation engine, which knows what you like. It knows what other people who are like you like and what they bought. And it puts the two together to suggest to you Okay, you like that, here's this. If you didn't exactly like that product that we put at the top of the, the, top of the page, here's 17 other products that are kind of like it. So you can decide exactly what you want. And if you check off two or three, it will compare them for you. Lovely. Increasingly, Amazon also offers promotions, advertising helps you to get your book recognized. You can spend some money and put it at the top of the page. Works for you. So for the customer, all of the filters come later. They come after you've finished with, the, with, with putting the book up. Still, so this has transformed the book business because all of those gatekeepers, they're not needed. They're not wanted. Now, we are, it is possible that we are um, in the, at the beginning stages of an extinction event, <coughs> the extinction event for publishers. Let's talk about why that might be, because after all, self-publishing is only a small fraction of what's going on in the book business. The traditional print publishers are doing okay. Admittedly, Amazon is squeezing them unpleasantly every day, but still, they're surviving. Let's drop back a little bit and think about what Amazon, how Amazon works more generally, and so we can get a better feel of how it's going to work in the book business. And Amazon is scale. Scale matters. Scale helps everywhere. Amazon is efficient and ruthless and relentless. It is capitalism in action. It does what it does because of the logic of what it does, not because it makes sort of decisions to be greedy or decisions to favor this or that. It is the logic of numbers and the logic of capitalism. It goes where the money is. Don't 
don't underestimate how much Amazon innovates. Think about the book business. They thought they figured out the book first website, they figured out one-click purchase, they figured out the logistic system, they figured out Kindle. They don't stop. They just keep pushing it along. Alexa uh, will be next. Amazon is a tremendous case of a company that consistently innovates and never bets the company. There isn't a, there's never been a bet the company decision from Amazon. Yeah, they put a lot of money into logistics. If it had failed, they would have gone back to something else, but it wouldn't have been out of business. Hard to stress how much the customer focus matters. That's, it, it's almost a cult at Amazon. Mm -hmm. It's worth understanding that. You can make decisions at Amazon, you can push things at Amazon by saying, this is what customers want. Amazon is great for customers. It's fantastic. And as we've seen, logistics are really their ace in the hole. That, that's what gives them an edge when they need an edge. So this is how the sort of amazing Amazon accelerating flywheel really works. You push scale up in different ways, and scale reduces cost. It means that you can squeeze your vendors and you can do better logistics. You have reduced cost, you get um, more engagement with customers. So these go through different little transformations. To get from scale to cost, you have to be prepared to invest. So they invested in their, in their logistics network primarily, and that made that transition from scale to reduced cost. Costs came down, what did they do with that money? They gave it to their customers. They didn't push up their, their margins and take profit out of the company, no. They squeezed down prices. They made it more attractive to engage with Amazon. And once they, and once they did that, they attracted more customers. And we know from Prime and, other, and the other things we've talked about that those customers stuck. So you get more customers sticking Amazon Prime customers spend more than twice as much as non-Prime customers on Amazon. So every year they spend 1700 bucks instead of 600 bucks. It matters, the engagement matters. So you can see this is a loop. It doesn't end, there's no end to this. Let's talk about how all this applies to the book biz. I'm happy to talk about Amazon beyond the book biz, but this is, these are a series of propositions which I, I am interested in people seeing whether people will agree with it. First, Amazon's share of print distribution is going to continue to grow. Whatever the size of the print market is, Amazon is going to take another 2 to 4% annually because they are the most efficient place to buy books. It, it's apparent that this is happening because Barnes & Noble is declining. 23% of books are sold through Barnes & Noble. That share goes down every year. Amazon eats it eats it from the other big um, bookstores. The indies are doing okay, but they're, they're, they're too small. They're, just, they're only 9% of the book market. So Amazon will continue to, to take more and more of the distribution market. Uh, Ebooks are gonna continue to grow too. They're growing in part because there are certain segments of the market that are, that are very ebook friendly, notably romance and, so, and science fiction. Lot, increasing, growing high percentages of those sectors are, are in ebooks, and we're going to see more and more of them. Textbooks, for example, are going to ebooks because they're too expensive. It's, it, it, students are, are simply not able to pay $150 for a very expensively published book. So the, you know, the publishers are realizing we have to do something different and ebooks are the way. We know audiobooks are going to keep growing, especially with Alexa. So publishing is the wild card. I, I think it is going to keep growing um, because the logic makes sense for authors. Once we eliminate the stigma of self-publication, which we are slowly doing, well, it, not we, it is slowly becoming less and less um, a problem to self-publish. Uh, I think, you know, we, we're, we're in the middle of that event, and it's, a, it's an event that the, the Amazon model 
just works a lot better for authors, provided that they can find the supports and the distribution and the edit freelance editors and the freelance cover designers. I found a great cover for my uh, upcoming book. I designed it in conjunction with a tremendous designer in Italy. It cost me 300 bucks to work through several iterations with him to find a great book. I don't need a publisher. Actually, I'm begging for a publisher, but don't get, uh, we, we don't really, uh, I'm begging for a publisher because right now, publishers are still the gatekeepers for the big books. For a best-selling book, you need to go through a, through an established publisher. But they're chipping away. The self-publishing model is chipping away. And I don't think that the publishers will stop it. It's a long-term process. Extinctions do take time, but that's where we're going. And of course, Amazon will keep squeezing out bigger, bigger discounts. Finally, worth noting that um, the, the one company that should be really, really, really terrified of Amazon isn't the publishers, it's Google. After all, would you rather spend your advertising money on Google, where people do random searches, or would you prefer to spend your money where people are actually buying products? Seems to me that Amazon is probably a good place to spend your money, which explains why Amazon's advertising business went from 4.5 billion in uh, 2017 to more than 10 billion in 2018. Google should be really worried. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Robin. I'm going to take the moderator's prerogative yeah. and ask the first question. And uh, it, 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 it reflects my own uh, pretensions of being an egghead to some degree and an intellectual snob. Um, if this self-publishing model takes hold and the random houses and the scriveners or whoever's left, the Oxford University Presses, if, if they go under, um, how does the society, the culture, uh, continue to get products of quality that keep enlightening us, educating us, bringing out our best, etc. Um, how do we make sure that the new literary masters, the new great scholars, keep appearing and keep hopefully influencing uh, human progress for the better? Without vetting of some kind, which presumably publishers, or I should say, the traditional publishers have been providing? So there's no doubt that traditional publishers um, try to find things that are popular and high quality. I, I think that's, they, and they would claim that they do a great job of doing that. Right. Uh, what we don't see are all the things that didn't get published, right? So we have a there's, a, there's a bias built into our view of publishing because what we see is what gets published. We don't see all the books that were rejected or found no friends or didn't get pushed or were left in remainder piles uh, around traditional bookstores. Um, so I, I think one has to be a little careful about uh, the sort of self-congratulatory model of, <laughs> of existing publishers. Um, you know, Kodak thought that it, it was providing a brilliant, wonderful, incredible service in in allowing people to print pictures. Um, they found out that there were better ways of doing it. Alan raises a fair, fair question, okay? So what do we think about a world that is filtered by public opinion and, and, and the marketplace rather than a world that is filtered by elite reviewers? Isn't that what's happening now? Increasingly, increasingly, but you know, it, I'm not as impressed by the um, old model. I'm somewhat fearful of the new model. Uh, it's not as though I think this is somehow uh, a brilliant and wonderful solution that will solve all our problems. It is more democratic. It allows more books to reach the surface. 
it changes the vetting process from an elite one to a competition for attention. Mm. And that has its dangers, we all know that. Uh, so, do I think it's necessarily better? I'm not prepared to say that it's necessarily better, I just think it's the future. You know, Bezos has a great quote about this. He said, Amazon didn't happen to the publishers, the future happened to the publishers. And in a, and in a certain sense, he's right. This, this tidal wave that has come over the industry and is changing it, it's sort of the future appearing, isn't it? It's not necessarily Amazon digging in and, and destroying people, it's Amazon as a medium through which the future appears. And we may not like it much. We may not. Or we may. We may. Yeah. Um, I'd like to open it up now to audience questions. I also would like to remind all of our online viewers, you are certainly free to pose questions. They will somehow magically appear on my cell phone from the YouTube comments box. So please send them in. We already have one, but I do want to give preference to the folks who are nice enough to show up at our Henry, Henry George School headquarters. I see one now. Um, I have Please two, identify yourself. I have two comments. Um, one is a point of clarification. When you said that uh, uh, UPS and FedEx were now sort of uh, marginalized, but yet my packages arrive from Amazon. Yeah, this is a process. I, 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 I exaggerate you for effect there. Oh, okay, okay. It, what's, what's point clear? taken. Let, I, so I will say one thing. You, you may have heard President Trump berating the post office for um, you know, giving Amazon an edge, making it cheaper. He, he's got it completely the wrong way around. I can't believe that. <laughs> the, the, the post office is, is dependent on Amazon. The post office needs that flow. And let me tell you, Amazon is taking no prisoners. In the last year, a year ago, 50% of Amazon packages were delivered by the post office. Today, it's 25%. They've cut the post office in half. We're going to be hearing screams from the post office a year from now when they report their revenue that, that Congress is going to be screaming, what happened? And the answer is Amazon happened. They've heard Mr. Trump, and they said, well, we're going to send, we're going to distribute through our own network instead of through Amazon. FedEx, FedEx is almost nothing. UPS is about a third of Amazon's distribution right now, but I leave that on its own future. My, 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 my real question was, though, is that we all recognize how successful they were in hijacking, if you will, the, the book industry. Yeah. What's next? Uh, so good question. Amazon will go everywhere that it can see opportunities to serve customers, which means everywhere, because everyone has customers where they can see an advantage, uh, they can see money, and they can see a way to leverage existing assets. So anywhere that they, their logistics business works for them, they'll go. So a year ago, they bought a company called PillPack. PillPack delivers medications, packaged medications. Fine. You, Amazon believes that they can send those medications over their network more cheaply and better. I imagine CVS is quaking in their shoes mm. because that could be picked up. Yeah, well, well, well I, I, I just want to mention one other, you know, places where you wouldn't think of it, right? I mean, we think of Amazon as a high-tech company. And, 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 um, yesterday, or the day before yesterday, they announced that you can now send um, uh, anything. One, you can buy goods of $1 and it will show up. The dollar stores are terrified. That's their business. Uh, they, I'm pleased to report there is a great follow-up question to that previous question that's come in from online. Okay. And the questioner asks, will Amazon's natural advantage in data collection allow them to identify products with low brand preference and produce Amazon branded goods to replace them? Oh, so this is a great question. Hmm. There's been a ton of stuff in the business press about Amazon's private label, uh, Amazon's private label goods. So you go on Amazon and you look for batteries, and you can find Duracell, you find Energizer, but you also find Amazon Basics. 
Amazon Basics are uh, cost less. They're cheaper. They've sourced it. This is a standard, um, a standard uh, approach that Walmart uses, Safeway uses. They each have their own in-house brands. Amazon just has much more data, so they can identify a specific brand that they could insert into a particular area, and they do it. They have thousands of brands, uh, hundreds of their own brands. I think that this is actually uh, a red herring. Um, you know, the Congress has gotten all steamed up about this, about how Amazon is basically stealing the bread out of the uh, out of the um, mouths of small vendors, and you know, Energizer is not that small, but nonetheless. Yeah. The idea is, is that because everybody sells through Amazon's marketplace, Amazon sees all the data, they can see where the profit opportunities lie, call up the manufacturer and say, okay, make me these. And there are some cases where that seems to be true. Now, this is tiny, 1% of Amazon's revenue. I believe that it's a red herring that Amazon will be delighted to throw in front of Congress. And they will scream and moan and say, oh yeah, well the safe ways of this world do it, and Walmart does it, and we should be allowed to do it. Well, all right, after three or four years, they will say, okay, enough, we won't do it anymore. And Congress will have spent four years worrying about that, while in fact, Amazon is expanding everywhere else. Got a question from up here? Yes. Yes, uh, my name is Ron. I have two questions. The first one is a little bit more of a, a, a judgment call. I appreciate that. But um, in all this efficiency that Amazon uh, is producing, um, in your opinion, because you looked at the, the detail, are they paying their fair amount of taxes to the community? <laughs> so this is, this is actually a broader question than taxes. It's a great question. Amazon is a fantastic company for customers. They are an appalling customer for all the producers. You know, they, they are all a company. So their workers, the vendors, the people who sell products to Amazon, they feel the full weight of Amazon's demand for endless efficiency, right? If Amazon can find a way to automate their warehouses, they will. If they can find a way to turn their workers into gig workers because it's more efficient for them, they will. If they can squeeze the vendors even more to give more back to the customer and to Amazon, they will. So, you know, your question is, do they, do they pay their fair share of taxes? They pay the amount of taxes that we demand they pay. In England, they pay nothing. What about, to give you a, a local example, which was a, a very, you know, a sore, sore spot uh, in New York City here, yes. and when Amazon wanted to create one of their major warehouses across the river, um, they basically, they, they, they squeezed the government, the city Absolutely. of New York. Yes. Uh, you know, they said, you know, we'll come here if you, if you jump through these hoops. Yes. Yeah. So, um, on, on the one hand, they can squeeze that way, on the other hand, how much tax avoidance are they paying? In other words, what, per you know, what, what percentage of their profits uh, are, are they actually paying in, in, in local, city, state, federal taxes? Yeah, okay, good question. I don't know the exact answer, and it varies. Because what Amazon is, in, in a bigger way, is kind of demanding is that we organize ourselves to handle Amazon. So it, it worked for Amazon to squeeze New York City, right, New York. I mean, it nearly worked. Um, it worked in Virginia, where the other half of HQ2 or whatever went. And Amazon does this everywhere. I have a list of all the places and all the stuff they've squeezed out of the cities. Well, stupid us, right? We allowed ourselves to be played. We allowed Amazon to play off New York against Baltimore and against Philadelphia and against everywhere else. Stupid us. We should, we should be organizing like the European Union does to put limits on it. Just like we should be helping the Amazon workers to organize so that they can at least have some say in the way that their working lives are run. 
Can I? And, and in fact, um, we're the only company right. that plays off U.S. states and U.S. localities against each other. Increasingly, this is the way business is done. And listen, it's just more efficient at all of this. You know, they understand how to do it. Yes. Okay, yeah. I, I have one more question, which is yeah. to totally diff in a different area. Yeah. And uh, Amazon has an incredible uh, uh, data on uh, all of its members, right? right? They have the most sophisticated algorithms possible. Uh, I'm sure if uh, I was a member of, Al of uh, Amazon Prime, they would probably know me better than I know myself. They would know what buttons to push to get me to buy this, vote for this person, be prejudiced and biased here. Um, the awesome amount of power that comes with the concentration of, of knowledge and data. I mean, it's also in Facebook, it's also in Google. The, these behemoths uh, are... Um, Question. Okay. Are uh, perhaps becoming... Uh, I know Mark Zuckerberg, for Ron, example. Ron, we need a question, okay? Please. The question is, do they have to be reined in? Are they becoming too powerful? Well, let me turn it around slightly, because obviously I've thought, had thought about this. But do the customers want that? Will, will the customers even put up with that? You know, it's one, I, I think in a way, Amazon is, in a better, is in, once again in better shape than Facebook and, and Google. You know, we, we've seen some of the ugly stuff coming out of Facebook, right? All the all the trolling and I mean, it's it, it's really bad. I mean, misinformation is a big problem. We haven't seen that from Amazon. Basically, if you're a customer of Amazon, all you see is goods showing up on your porch. Mm. You don't see any of the backstage stuff, which is where the ugly stuff happens. So. Your point, your point about data, though, is, is entirely true. The question is, how much are we prepared to give these companies in order for them to provide us with the services they, they offer? And the answer seems to be everything. We're, we're prepared to give it all up. Yeah. Uh, Robin, if I could follow up on that. Um, it, it seems clear that Amazon's decision to be a platform for everybody else puts real limits on their desire to rig the marketplace one way or the other. But when you're talking about content, and especially book publishing, magazine publishing, if Amazon gets into that, um, in principle, uh, the company would have great power to decide, gee, uh, Here's something that's critical of so-called big tech. Down to the bottom of the list it goes. Well, uh, we'll see, won't we? Okay. And I'll uh, when I publish my books. <laughs> right, that's right. It sounds like, though, it, it, it may be too early to tell. You see, I don't think, I don't think they care. I, um, I think, you know, if you think about it, do they care if you buy Adam Smith or Karl Marx? Not really. Mm -hmm. Just buy something. <laughs> They, they don't care about the content. I don't. I don't see why they would care. They were very upset about the everything store by Brad Stone. That Bezos was personally offended. His wife wrote a long, critical review on Amazon. Oh. So it was one of the first reviews of that book. Um, they still care. Right. It's still there. They, they, it's just business. Fascinating. And, and you know, same with magazines. If, if you want to buy one, buy one. If they don't like, if they don't have an institutional view on this stuff. You know, they may have personal views, and but it, but it's the algorithm. The algorithm or, is what works. Or the company, even if it has got an institutional view, um, there seems to be no evidence yet that it's it's actually it's actually been acting on it. I think that's true. Okay. Okay. Just to clarify. So of course, oh, how okay. how anyone would know. I don't know. That's because, it's, as you pointed out, it's a very secretive company. Yeah. And, and I would say, sorry, there's just one thing there. I do think that when, you know, people talk about how to rein Amazon in antitrust, or maybe break them up, or maybe turn them into a utility of some kind, um, I think that we need to think more outside the box. We need to think about what we allow companies to keep private in their own operations. Sure. We need to be much more radical in insisting that Amazon and all other big companies 
reveal much more about their operation. Well, especially if they're not privately owned, which they're not. Right. But I don't think it even matters. Mm -hmm. I mean, we need to know as much about big private companies as we are. I mean, I, I just think we're, we're on, we need to go in a different direction. All the way to back. Yeah, just following up on yeah. Amazon. Please speak up. Sure, just Thanks. following up on Amazon as a book publisher and the self-publishing model and when you talk about the demise of the gatekeeper. Yeah. When you think about the demise of the gatekeeper in other places, like newspapers, like uh, the evening news, yeah. like magazines, and when you now, how do you feel, how can we think about this as a contributor to the increased polarization that we're now experiencing all over the globe, actually, where we're now each in our own echo chambers, and now if I don't even have to have a gatekeeper for the books I want to read, Right. Now, if I'm on the side of the divide versus another, and all of my information now, whether it's news content, book content, how, how do we, <laughs> how do we well, consider that as a good for society now if I can, uh, it just gives me another avenue to not get out of my echo chamber? Really good, really good point. So there's a, an excellent book uh, by Martin Guri uh, called... Um, Sold on uh, Amazon? Uh, you can get it on Amazon. <laughs> Uh, called the revolt, of, and, and it's about the revolt of the public against the elites. And this is, in a certain sense, another dimension of that. This is a this is a revolt of people who who I mean, it, it, it's mediated by Amazon, of course, but but in a certain sense, it's a shift of power away from the elite mm -hmm. who are able to frame how historically frame the debate. Is that man? Wow! I keep shutting this off. All right, sorry. <laughs> I trust, um, I trust we can all identify those opening chords <laughs> of, of, yeah. of your baby boomers yeah, yeah. Um, trivia quiz following. You know, we, we've, um, um, this is a, really about what is the role of the elites in, in framing our discourse. And Amazon's model is radical. It's to say there is no role. We've seen that, as you point out, elsewhere and the consequences ain't so good, uh, but it's really hard for any of us to stand up and say, more elites, need more elites. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the, Because they've done such a great job right, so Right, they have done such a great job so, so far in so many areas. So one can understand why that's not a popular thing to say, and I'm certainly not here to say it. But Yeah, but I mean, you could look back, back at history and would you say that they didn't do a good job for the... 30, 40, 50 years that we had these models of newspapers, of, of media, of book publishers, and now what's the result of Depends the new on. model? And do we say that that's what we're experiencing now is defined as success? Because I now don't have to go to the bookshop and see titles I don't want to see. Right. And algorithms right. going to give me only titles based on, they're not going to give me titles that would expand my worldview, right. that would make me challenge my thought. They're only going to feed me what I would get. We so, you happen. know, it, 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 in part, it depends on where you sit, doesn't it? I mean, if, if you were a minority or a woman during those 40 wonderful years, maybe it wasn't quite as open and wonderful as we would have thought. Um, so I completely take your point. I, you know, this, this is an echo chamber world we're building thanks to the algorithms that are being fed to us by our friends in the news and our friends at Amazon, everywhere else. We are, we've been told, well, if you like that, you'll like this. Uh, that, you know, and to be honest, we're getting that on campus too to some degree. Oh, yeah. We've got one more question from the online world. It's a little less cosmic, okay, uh, right. but the questioner wants to, uh, wants to get some idea of how significant was the one-click buy now patent to Amazon's success? Uh, Would you rank it number one or number four? Um, it, uh, all I can say is it was important, but I think the, the, the point of that last circular slide mm. is that everything's important. It all, the, the thing about Amazon, which makes it really so different, is that the pieces fit together. It, you know, it's not like Walmart, which figured out how to have low prices and built a supply chain all the way to China to supply low prices. Well, fine, but Amazon fits the low prices into the, lo into the, the low prices for customers, 
and then into increased volume, and then volume drives more, and it's, a, it's dynamic. So you can say one click really helped with, with frictionless purchase. Terrific. It meant that every customer they got onto their website was more likely to buy something. But they still have to get the customer, they still have to have the logistics, it all fits together. I'll ask the, the final question, okay. um, and, and it, it may wind up ending our session on a more hopeful note, mm -hmm. um, and that is, is it possible that because of the pricing pressure it puts on vendors, that Amazon can turn into a tremendously powerful productivity enhancing machine? In the sense that it's basically telling vendors, if you want to keep making the kinds of profits that you were before the Amazon age came on, you've got to get more efficient yourself, which means higher productivity, which we're taught, at least by, uh, by conventional economics, is good for the economy, is good for workers, is good for the whole society. So it's a really interesting point. Um, I, I would say that in a certain sense, Amazon has helped to create a Darwinian, a more Darwinian world for producers, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you go onto the marketplace as a vendor, you're immediately going to be faced with people doing knockoffs, people trying to take your lunch, and you have to be able to figure out how to, how to survive in this very Darwinian world. In, in a sense, then, that is indeed a driver for productivity, and it is creating more competitive markets. So, all, all that is good. But, we had highly competitive markets in the 19th century. And we had to go through a hundred years of struggle to get to a social contract where the benefits of those markets were matched by protections for labor, protections for the environment, and so on. There is a clear risk that Amazon's relentless drive for efficiency Will, will drive us back into a 19th century world where really everything is open for exploitation, and I don't think any of us want that. So no free productivity lunch? You can have it, but you can't allow a company to build its productivity on the back of a gig economy and, and a ruthless exploitation of everybody around it. I, I don't think any of us wants it. Well, on that maybe less hopeful note, <laughs> um, I'd like to uh, close the session by thanking Robin so much for a really phenomenally provocative presentation, full of wonderful big data. <laughs> and I'd like to thank uh, I'd like to thank all of you who turned out here at the Henry George School, and I'd also like to thank all of our online viewers uh, for some great questions too. And we hope to see you again in our next seminar. Thanks so much.